In the first two parts of this series, we examined the use of paper cartridges with the Baker rifle. In this video, we'll further refine the experiments by assessing and testing different methods of manufacture and use with a view to ascertaining with the best possible educated guess the types of cartridges used during the Napoleonic Wars. Oh, and if I'm not dressed like this for the rest of the video, never fear, the rifle green shall return. So far, the series, throughout two parts, has made a considerable stab at examining the use of paper cartridges with the Baker rifle. To recap, in part one, we shot the unpatched cartridge and compared it to the loose patch and ball. In the second part, we experimented with three types of cartridge containing a patched ball. The thistle, the container pattern, and the Masseron pattern. I might recommend, if you haven't watched the two previous videos, that you do so now, before watching this one, as it will put things and references made in this video into context. Following on from these, there was much, much more work to be done. Namely, by further refining the container pattern cartridge by introducing subtle changes in the composition of its constituent parts. Here, in this video, we'll experiment with the container pattern, featuring a tied fabric patch, a sewn fabric patch, a sewn leather patch, and a glued leather patch. The patching. The leather I used for these experiments measured some 0 0.027 in thickness while the fabric I used measured 0 0.02. The paper used for the cartridges here was cut in the following fashion, six inches wide, with the sides being five and three respectively. During the production of this video, certain technical revelations came to light. Sadly, my camera decided that it would now focus intermittently. This will become evident once the video progresses. My sincerest apologies, the problem has now been fixed. The first cartridge to be tried was the container pattern with the tied fabric patch. The initial steps of tying the patch around the bullet were the same as those I used in the previous experiments, part two of this series. By placing the patch over the jig and pushing the ball through the patch into the jig, it gathered the ends and enabled the string to be tied around it. Here, I made sure not to tighten it too much and leave the string in a diameter only slightly smaller than that of the ball. The string was trimmed. Then, in a new step, the ends of the patching were cut off and trimmed. This left a nice streamlined profile, which would work well inside the cartridge. The ball and patch combination were rolled around in liquid shortening to lubricate it, which, once it was dried, actually helped maintain the position of the string around the patch. The rolling of the cartridge followed on from techniques that were used in part two of the series. Namely, the folding over of the end of the cartridge to form a barrier within, between the powder and the ball. The trimmed patch round ball was then seated with the opening facing into the cartridge, which was then rolled tightly around it. The top was choked in the usual fashion, and then tied tightly with string. The extra bits were trimmed off, and the excess paper at the end was cut and dressed off. The cartridge was filled with 100 grains of 2F powder. Once this was done, the cartridge was tied off, sealing the powder within. A quick twist, and the ends of the strings were snipped off. Although not really required, I thought, in this case in retrospect, that I should choke below the ball in the cartridge. This choke point, when tied with string, makes a good positive separation between the ball and the powder, despite the fact that the construction of the cartridge puts a paper barrier between them. Overall, it makes for a slightly tighter and more robust cartridge. Later, I would conduct this step before filling the cartridge. The use of the cartridge was quite simple. First, biting the end off, exposing the powder. Then, shaking a few grains into the open pan. Once the pan was shut, the rifle was placed butt on the ground, barrel to the front, between the knees. 
The remaining powder was shaken into the barrel. And then, with a second bite, the ball end of the cartridge was torn open, exposing the patched ball inside. A slight pinch brought the ball proud of the paper. Inverting the cartridge, the ball was placed patch down in the muzzle. Simultaneously, the string was withdrawn from around the patch. The ball was then rammed in the normal fashion. You can see here in this demonstration, the use of the cartridge is quite simple if slightly finicky when it comes to withdrawing the string off the patch. The benefit that this method has over the method I practiced previously was the fact that the string is removed before placing the patched ball in the barrel. This, as was found earlier, is critical, as you might imagine, for good accuracy, allowing the patch to come completely separated from the ball when it leaves the muzzle. Four, five. Uh, a little bit low, just a shade, and I pulled one off to the right there, but uh, pretty much on par for a hundred yard baker shoot. A slight comment used in loading that particular type of cartridge. Uh, the method I used to tie the patch to the ball a lot less uh, tight, as it were, uh, compared to the last time. And what this allowed uh, to happen more easily this time was that when pinching the ball out of the end of the cartridge into the muzzle, I was able then to just, with my fingernail, grab and pick the string off with relative ease, which left essentially a normal patched round ball in the muzzle. The second version I tried was also of the container pattern, but with this time a sewn leather patch. The patches were cut in squares of one and a half inches. Here you can compare its size to an appropriate side round ball. I borrowed a technique that I had developed when manufacturing the Massarone pattern cartridge from part two, namely a small piece of 5 8 copper pipe on top of which was placed the patch and the round ball was nested in the middle of it. Slight downward pressure folded the ends and made sure that the ball and patch combination were tight. The sewing of the cartridge was somewhat delicate and slightly finicky, but the technique once practiced was quite simple. Again, this was the technique that I had used when manufacturing the Massarone pattern and consisted of a simple stitch at each corner of the square patch. This method leaves two loose ends of thread, which, when drawn together and tied, pull together the corners of the leather patch like the petals of a flower. The thread was trimmed off. And the, well let's call them the wings of the cartridge, as shown here, were trimmed off to make it more streamlined inside the cartridge. The ball and patch were lubricated with shortening and placed on a sheet to dry. The method of rolling the cartridge was essentially identical to that of the previous pattern using the tied fabric patch, making the compartmentalizing fold as well as placing the ball with the opening of the patch facing into the cartridge. I made sure that I choked both above and below the ball, each of which were tied off The cartridge was filled with the same amount of powder and tied off in the same fashion. The method of loading with this cartridge was virtually identical to that used with the cartridge featuring the tied patch. Again, 
a gentle squeeze presented the ball ready for loading. Placed with the closed end facing down into the muzzle, the open end, as you can see here, is presented to the top. Note the stitching. One thing I did notice with the leather patching, and probably as a result of not lubricating it most thoroughly, was the fact that it did at times get stuck in the barrel. Nothing that was not overcome, however, with a little bit of extra elbow grease. So that was uh, five routes with a sewn leather patch. One, two, three, four, and one way down here. Uh, to me, that in particular is a result of the patch not stripping away. Uh, I do know that I used some somewhat stronger thread. It might have been nylon. Uh, before I was able to dig up some cotton or some other uh, less strong thread. So if that was indeed the case, that that stronger thread uh, made the patch stick to the ball for a further distance before it shed, it stands to reason that the farther that patch travels with the ball, the less accurate that ball is going to be. So, is that the case? I honestly can't tell right now. Uh, let's just say so. Regardless, the other four, one, two, three, four, right there where they should be. So, uh, as far as accuracy goes, this one notwithstanding, this is actually not too bad. So of the 15 rounds that I shot today, I was only able to find one patch, which happened to be uh, one of the leather examples. You can see with a, a piece of the thread still attached that had sewn it around the ball. The little cutouts on the side there are a, as a result of trimming the wings off of the patch once it's been sewn around the, the ball. Uh, that just makes things a little bit more streamlined. You can see that everything is in order as far as the condition of it goes. Very little wear. You could probably use this again. Not that I will or anything. Which is again much the same as my previous experiments with uh, leather patches. That they seem to be quite resilient. Um, expensive. Uh, in the big scheme of things. There is of course some historical record of leather being used. But as much as that is the case, there's also lots of uh, examples of uh, fabric being used as well. The third pattern of cartridge used for these particular experiments was also the container pattern, but with this time a sewn fabric patch. I won't bore you with a complete demonstration because the methods used here have already been explained. The patch was sewn around the ball in the same fashion as with the leather. and the hole was lubricated. Following this, it was rolled into a cartridge in exactly the same fashion as with the leather patch. Well, it looked pretty good walking up here. Well, it is. I wouldn't call it exceptional, but certainly uh, one of the better groups, and it's always nice when the best group of the day is the last one. One, two, three, four, five. All, I don't know, three and a half, four inches maybe. That is uh, a really good group uh, that, in my experience, uh, that you can get with me. Usually it's more around six to eight. Uh, that said, um, that style of cartridge was pretty much the same as the rest of them, uh, as far as loading goes. I would say that if variables and the number of them impacts accuracy, then this method of using a sewn fabric patch compared to say the Masserone, where you are uh, loading the remnants of the paper cartridge below as some sort of a wad, uh, below the patch, so that introducing another variable. This is, dare I say better? One, the patches protected from outside contamination, despite the fact that it contaminates the cartridge, and we discussed that earlier. Uh, it's a little bit better as far as keeping it in the pouch of packaging. Uh, the Masserone is this, sort of looks like a flower, as you recall, and it just does not come across 
as a military cartridge. This pattern, the container pattern, let's call it, uh, with a sewn uh, or tied for that matter, patched round ball inside it, uh, without that cartridge being an integral part of the loading procedure, it seems, in what we've done here, to be the better solution. The final pattern of cartridge used was the container pattern with a glued leather patch. Now, some evidence suggests that leather patching was cut to shape and then glued to the ball. It was then presumably lubricated. Initially, I decided on a pre-cut cross-shaped patch. This was a lot of work, and to be frank, I just didn't want to spend the time figuring out the dimensions of the patch shape. Perhaps more time in getting the shape right would have yielded slightly better results, but in the end, I decided on a method that began in a similar fashion to the sewn leather patch, with the use of the dye made out of copper tubing. The patch was soaked in glue and then pulled up and around the ball. The so-called wings were trimmed and the remainder was left to dry, after which the hole was lubricated in the usual way. Despite liberal use of glue, the arrangement did seem rather delicate. It was rolled into a cartridge with the open end of the patching facing in. The use of the cartridge was nearly identical to that featuring the sewn patches of either leather or fabric. So, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I must say that I was expecting something that wasn't quite as consistent as with other methods. Uh, that glued patch, I fear, is sticking to the ball a little longer, uh, farther in flight, uh, and thereby uh, making the ball deviate from its true course uh, all the more. You can see the point of aim being here, and here we go, way on the left here. The remainder are within uh, the usual uh, 8 inches or so at 100 yards. Speed testing had been completed with the variations featured in parts 1 and 2, and I thought that it might be interesting to complete a somewhat comprehensive examination of six of the different loading schemes. I chose the following to use. The unpatched ball cartridge used as a sort of control, a tied fabric cartridge, a sewn fabric cartridge, sewn leather, glued leather, and finally the Masserone pattern. You'll at once notice that the thistle pattern is not contained in this particular experiment. It was, however, measured for speed in part two. This time will be used to compare it against the other types of cartridges. As you might expect, the unpatched ball cartridge got off to an early lead. The Masserone was right behind. The sewn fabric, sewn leather, and glued leather versions all came next. Some misfire issues with the glued leather notwithstanding. The times in such circumstances were prorated when it came to figuring out the standing between them. Finally, the tide patch with the extra step of having to remove the string got one away. I found that generally things went along quite smoothly. The odd misfire and some delay in fishing for the cartridge in the pouch notwithstanding. I found that the method of construction used for the tied fabric patch resulted in multiple layers of fabric. This resulted in some very stiff loading, as you will see. Somewhat surprisingly, the Masserone cartridge came out on top, beating the unpatched ball by a couple of seconds. This was probably due to my inefficient movements, digging in the pouch. The sewn leather, glued leather, and sewn fabric, unsurprisingly, had very little to separate them. While the tied fabric patch unsurprisingly brought up the rear. <laughs> 
there were a couple of observations made while conducting these practices, namely with the glued leather patch. With it, I found it quite difficult to ascertain which exactly was the top of the patch ball. The way the leather came together, the glue, and the lubricant all came together to form a very mottled appearance. It would have been easy to have loaded the ball sideways, and this would have proved to be quite inaccurate. The sewn leather patch, with the different colored thread used, provided a ready reference to ensure the ball and patch were positioned at the muzzle correctly. As mentioned, time to correct misfires was taken into account, but the extra seconds digging in the pouch were not. So, with the head-to-head -head speed shooting complete, I felt that I had collected enough information to make some basic conclusions. Well, that's a lot of shooting. I think it's safe to say, without putting too fine a point on it, that we've given the subject of paper cartridges with the Baker rifle its due. We've done a lot of shooting and collected a fair amount of data, times, and etc. Uh, this, combined with a well degree of, uh, let's call it, uh, subjectivity, although trying to be as objective as possible, all that's left now is to somehow arrive at a conclusion. In order to do that, I've arrived at the following categories to rate each of the cartridges selected for the test. They are the manufacturer, ease of use, accuracy, rate of fire, and durability. We'll rate each of those cartridges against those five criteria, and at the end, we should arrive at some conclusion as to which, hypothetically speaking, may have been the pattern of cartridge used in the Napoleonic era. Now the process I'll use to try and arrive at the conclusion as to the best possible style of cartridge is to assign a point value based on the inverse of its standing within that category. A first place would rate a six and a last place rate a one and so on. In terms of manufacture, I rated the versions this way. I found the easiest to make was the tied fabric cartridge. As you might expect, with all the gluing and sewing, the Masserone pattern was the most complicated. For ease of use, or functionality, the Masserone pattern excelled, while the string-tied and somewhat finicky thistle pattern fell to the bottom of the list. Accuracy was somewhat more objective, the results on the target speaking for themselves. The sewn fabric came out on top, while the glued leather proved to be the least accurate. Speed or rate of fire much of which, which measured in the compilation seen previously, saw the Masserone pattern with the best time. The finicky, tied fabric cartridge took the most. The final category, durability, was something I thought to rate against after examining the Masserone pattern. So strong in some areas, but I felt so weak and perhaps unmilitary in others, namely in this category. Ammunition would have to endure packaging, storage, transport, and a prolonged period in a man's pouch before use. This was an important category. I rated them like this. So the numbers are crunched, and here are the conclusions. The thistle pattern with 13 points, the glued leather pattern with 14 points, the Masserone pattern with 16, the tied fabric, interestingly, with 17, the sewn leather patch with 22, and the sewn fabric patch with 24 points. Beautiful out here, isn't it? Well, I hope you've enjoyed this series on the use of paper cartridges with the Baker rifle. I know I've had a great time filming it, although it's taken a fair degree of time to get from the beginning to the end. But I hope that the three videos, when put together, will form a good, comprehensive look at the subject. Of course, it goes without saying that much of the subject material has been in the realm of, shall we say, experimental history. That is to say, we don't know specifically how the cartridges were made during the Napoleonic era. We do, however, have one specific reference, and that is to the Masserone pattern. This, of course, postdates the Napoleonic Wars and is found uh, detailed in DeWitt Bailey's book. In that volume, of course, it does speak of two types of cartridges used with the rifle, one with unpatched ball and one with patched ball. Based on the series of experiments in these series of videos, I would say that the container pattern with a sewn fabric patch would probably have been the method used. So moving forward, I can safely assume 
that my shooting with the Baker rifle will probably consist of the use of hmm, one of three different kinds of ammunition. What? I'm literally almost done. That was the last thing I was going to say. But you stampede in here, making all this racket, and what is it? What could possibly be more important than just letting me finish this right now? Hmm? The French? <laughs> They'll be coming in swarms! This quick march is called Jalalabad. At the time of the production of this video, the only reference to the actual manufacture of patched Baker cartridges is contained in DeWitt Bailey's book. The Masseron cartridge, of course, has been featured extensively in this series. As I was putting the finishing touches to it, I came across this picture, thanks to John of the British Military Forum, who also let me know about it at the same time. It is of a 54 caliber patched round ball cartridge for a Mississippi rifle of the American Civil War era. It appears to be a version of the container pattern cartridge, as used in the experiments in this series. As you can see, the patching is exposed, presumably by forcing it through the cartridge tube until it was positioned appropriately, tied off and then presumably lubricated. It would seem to function nearly the same as the later Pritchett cartridge for the P53, with the powder emptied and then the cartridge reversed, bullet placed at the muzzle with the excess paper torn away, of course ramming normally after that. Now, this procedure would seemingly have left the string around the ball and patch, and this would lead to the horrible problems that were experienced by myself in part two of this series. Or perhaps was the ball held in place by friction and lubricant, simply being pinched out of the paper, as was the case with the later container pattern from part three. I don't know for sure, but we could surmise that one of these two methods was used. Although from a much later period, extremely interesting nonetheless. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below.